Welcome to Poker VIP. Uh, my name is James Keyes, and uh, welcome to my video series on game theory. Um, this is part one, which I've called Introduction to Game Theory, um, imaginatively. Um, so, yes, let's get started. Uh, quite a snazzy presentation made up for me by the guys at Poker VIP. Um, so, I'm looking forward to using that. Um, Game Theory Optimal. GTO is one of poker's best kept secrets, apparently. Um, and you know, kind of what I mean is uh, that you could read uh, the whole of Super System, and uh, you could read probably the whole of Caro's Book of Tales, or maybe even Harrington on Hold'em, I can't remember. And you could read uh, you know, most poker news articles, or uh, Vicky Corrin's column in the Guardian on poker. I would, you know, you could go through all of these without ever hearing the words game theory. Um, but it's actually, you know, the, the the concepts, what it describes, underpins all of poker. If we go to the next slide, <laughs> sorry about that. There we go. A few little teething problems there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, a lot of the greatest players in the world use GTO without realising, I mean, it's kind of a geeky sort of mathematical subject um, on the surface, but uh, if you're playing poker well, you'll actually be using a lot of the concepts um, in GTO, such as balance, you know, keeping your opponents guessing. Um, an old school way of keeping your opponents guessing might be sometimes I limp with races, sometimes I raise with races, or sometimes I talk when I'm bluffing, sometimes I talk when I've got the nuts. Um, and GTO is really just a similar way of doing that sort of thing, but in a way such that it's less predictable um, and more uh, accessible to people who don't have years of experience um, hoodwinking people. Uh, so you use randomness uh, a lot more and ranges and so on to to balance and keep your opponents guessing. Um, and yeah, of course now so with the poker boom, um, a lot of people have come to poker from uh, sciences, you know, university dropouts or even university graduates um, doing things like economics, maths even. Um, I personally did physics at university. Um, and they're starting to sort of, well, we're probably into the tenth year now of people from that sort of side of the game taking, taking over um, and really... Um, making their mark and at the highest stakes uh, the best players Source and well, Source is a, a main one of the main protagonists and also um, Tom Dwan and uh, Isildur um, really have taken it way way beyond where poker was before the poker boom and most of that is using GTO despite that it can be actually Having had a quick search myself, it's quite hard to find poker relevant GTO material online. When you search for game theory and game theory optimal, you'll get some Wikipedia articles or um, other sort of academic writings that are mainly relevant to sort of maths and applied mathematics. Um, so if you really wanted to look deep into poker related game theory, uh, where I find the best resource was um, when I read. The Mathematics of Poker by Bill Chen. Um, so once you've seen this video and if you you're still if you're curious and want to know more, I would go on Amazon and order that. I don't have an affiliate link, so sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on there. All right, what is game theory? Uh, it's a method of logically solving a game, uh, and you can use it on. Any any sort of game where there's um, two or more players and, and you're trying to overcome the other and, and get some kind of win, so it's not cooperative. Uh, although I think you could probably apply game game theory to team games as well. Um, but tic tac toe poker and also quite famously uh, war games, uh, game theory is used a lot in in things like that. So it's it's very wide application of a variety of possible uses. Um, the main aim is to devise 
a strategy to overcome your opponents. And the simple games such as uh, tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses uh, or connect four, you know, there's not many variables in games like that. Um, you could you could literally build a a decision tree that like a, like a roadmap or a you know a starting hand chart that tells you what to do in every possible situation that could arise. Uh, and that has been done. I mean, you learn as a child how to do that in noughts and crosses and never lose. And connect four has been solved. Um, by computer, and I think uh, there's different kinds of solved in uh, inverted commas. Um, you can have like perfect solutions where uh, the game knows the best move from any, uh, the theory tells you the best move from any position, or you can have sort of half solutions where you can you solve you solve the game provided your opponent plays perfectly. But if they make mistakes, then yeah, you're on your own again. Uh, and also. There's, there's games that are simple um, but have random elements. Um, sorry, I'll go back a bit. In games without a random element, sorry, um, such as shuffled cards or a die, so like the games above, tic tac toe, connect four, um, a GTA strategy will be un unbeatable um, if you're going first or. You know, it, it's it's not possible to to do better than the game theory strategy, and any sort of deviation will, will cost you. Even games like uh, drafts and theoretically chess, while it's not simple because there's no random element, there, there there is somewhere a game theory optimal strategy. I think that was actually what the original Nobel Prize in game theory was. Uh, someone showed that you, there's always a GTO strategy somewhere, um, but that's quite. Uh, applied mathematics maybe not t too interesting to poker viewers um, but yes in games with a random element uh, your GTO strategy obviously can lose uh, any strategy with a random element you know even if it's just getting in aces against 7-2 off you know you can lose um, but over the long run the GTO strategy will still be unbeatable um, a common example used to describe game theory situations and how uh, it applies to random randomness um, rock paper scissors any strategy with an equal amount of, you could say oh, I know how to beat rock paper scissors I, I throw mostly rock because people usually start with scissors or mostly paper because you usually start with your rock but either way if it's unbalanced a savvy opponent could then exploit and beat it um, whereas if it's completely perfectly balanced your opponent, it doesn't really matter what they do if, you know, they, they can't overcome it if you're throwing one third of each. Um, but you would also need to make uh, make your throws unpredictable. Like if you threw rock, then you threw scissors, then you threw paper, and every time you threw rock you were always going to throw scissors next. Uh, you know, obviously that would be even easier to exploit than someone who threw rock too often or, or anything. And so true randomness, so 33% or one third each of rock, the paper and the scissors is the only one that cannot be beaten and since it cannot be beaten that's the the game theory optimal strategy so applying it um, to a heads up poker or a simplified version of heads up poker how can we take this sort of so far quite abstract and wishy-washy uh, stuff about unexploitable and unbeatable and apply it to poker how can we use that um, well, we'll start slow um, so this is a super simplified game of poker where each player only gets one card and they only have two chips and player A is left of the button or whatever he gets to act first, he can choose to go all in or fold uh, he doesn't, he can't limp or anything like that, there's nothing, just to keep it simple and player B you can either call or fold and you know, if player goes, if player A goes all in, player B can then call or fold um, if both players go in, there's a showdown and the highest card wins um, how would you play this game? Um, I didn't mention any, any blinds, if there were no blinds there would be no reason for player A to ever steal you know, take a two and go all in. 
because if player B then falls, the the player A doesn't win anything. Um, so the only reason to go all in would be if you think B will call the worst hand. And likewise, B would never call with a five when it costs him nothing to fold. You know, he's risking money when he doesn't need to. He could just call with the nuts. Um, so the GTO in this strategy, the GTO strategy for that game would just be to simply wait for the the, the best possible hand. And uh, if you did anything else, you'd just be throwing money away because either the other person would fold and you would win nothing or they would call with the nuts and you would lose. Um, it's quite a common tra trait among GTO strategies. You know, you can't... The GTO strategy is unbeatable, you can't lose, but at the same time, you don't really win very much unless your opponent does something stupid. So, like, like tic-tac-toe, if you if you play noughts and crosses, there's no point in... If, if you play right, it always ends in a draw. If you play, you know, there's no no point in trying to do something extravagant and trap, your, trap the other guy and lay him a sort of you know, intricate trap because you'll just lose, you'll get beaten. Um, but in a more complex game like poker, quite often, in fact most of the time even uh, in, in current games, it's worth um, deviating from the GTO strategy, um, playing a few too many hands, or being a little bit too tight and not bluffing enough in some spots, to then induce a mistake from an opponent, uh, and then get more game from it later, especially as quite often in, in cash games the, the the bets and the pots will early on in the hand be very small but by the river will be very big. So if you can make a small pre-flop mistake that then leads to your opponent making wrong assumptions and making a big river mistake in a big pot, it will it will pay for itself in the long run. However, it's a good idea to understand GTO anyway so that you can know when and how you're deviating from the GTO strategy and and why um, to make sure that you know you are doing a, a right um, you're making correct mistakes if that makes sense. So let's go back to that simple game. Um, we'll now say that player B has to post a blind, so one chip. I mean, he has two chips. That's half his stack, um, and now. Player A can now win a chip when he bluffs or when he goes all in and player B folds. So now there's a financial reward for a successful bluff, so there's a logical incentive for A to bluff. Uh, when, he, when he does bluff, he'll be risking his two chip stack to win the one chip out there, so he'll need to win um, two thirds of the time, two times out of three to make a profit. And when B, when A does go all in, B will have to call one to win the whole pot which is free so he would only need to win 25% of the time when he calls to make a profitable call um, just going back a bit fleshing out the game because um, I forgot to write this earlier uh, so to keep things simple we'll say that we'll use a deck of cards where there's only uh, the cards number one to eight there's only eight cards um, number one to eight so there are no ties and the highest card wins it showed out and there's no board or anything like that so uh, in the game if player A just chose blind um, player B the decision well player B is faced with a decision when he looks at his cards he can he calls with the eight obviously because that's the nuts but he's getting good odds to call with the seven and all the way down to the the three with the three, he beats the two and the one. Uh, he loses to the, the four to through the eight. So he actually does win two times out of seven, which is 28.6% of the time. He only needs to win 25% of the time to make a profit. So when he looks down at the three and A is shoved blind, B has a profitable call. You can see that obviously with B calling three to eight, that's 75% of the time. Um, player A's bluffs. They needed to work 67% of the time, so they're not going to be profitable um, when they're only working 25%. Uh, so A will probably find uh, a better strategy would be looking at his card. Um, so let's think about what that strategy should be. If B's calling all those cards 3 to 8, um, 
then A could shove 6, 7 and 8 Valiant. But then if A was only shoving 6, 7 and 8, B would have... A could only possibly win if he was dealt a 7 or an 8, because if he's dealt a 6, then uh, A shoves. He can only have 7 or 8 because B has a 6. There's no tie. So if B has only can possibly only profit with 7 or 8, there'll be no point ever calling with a 6. But if he does only ever call with 7 and 8, A can now bluff again with impunity. Um, because B will be folding 75% of the time ish. I mean, there's, there's a card removal effect, but anyway. Um, and this this sort of alternating or whips away from tight to loose and back again is really common in GTO situations. So, like, you can say, oh, if I never bluff here, then he should never call, but if he never calls, then I could bluff all the time. Um, and yeah, this is a common trait of situations where there will be a GTO solution. A game theory would have an answer on what the, the right answer is, in inverted commas, and what the perfect strategy is. Um, so B has to really, uh, he has to, he wants to call us the seven and the eight, um, because you know they're going to be ahead enough of the time, but also to deter A from bluffing. He'll have to have uh, some bluff catches in his range to sort of to stop A having a profitable opportunity because it's a zero sum game. Any time that A has a profitable bluff opportunity, that is going to cost B. So B has to sort of defend against that. So even though theoretically, if he's calling with the six, it could there's, there's potential strategies where the six could never ever be good. Um, he needs to call some sometimes with the six just to sort of hold off the threat of bluffing. And there is a correct frequency, the right frequency of bluff catches will make A indifferent to bluffing. So that when he gets dealt the one, uh, it doesn't matter if he bluffs or folds. Because he will he'll make he'll break even in the long run whichever one. So what frequency would that be? Where do we start? Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, when... What is... <laughs> the title has thrown me off here, sorry. I put the wrong title on this slide. Um, so anyway, ignore the title. Um, since A needs B to fold two thirds of the time for a, or more for a bluff to be a good idea, calling exactly one third of the time when A is bluffing will make him indifferent to bluffing. Um, to achieve this, um, B wants to be calling one third of the time, and when A has a bluff card, there are seven cards remaining. One third of seven cards is two and one, two point three three or two and one third cards. Um, logically. We would use our best cards, so the eight. Obviously, we're always going to call that, so that's one. The seven is our next best card, so we'll call that. So we've got two, and now we just need one third of the time of one third of a card more, and we'll obviously we'd use the six because it's the highest one. Um, with us taking that strategy, A can shove the six, the seven, the eight, uh, but with the the one and the, the one and the five are the same um, with those cards. If he shoves he'll win um, two thirds of the time, exactly. He'll win one chip, but then he'll get called and lose one third of the time, and lose two chips. So overall, it's zero, which is the same equity as folding, so it doesn't matter. He was completely indifferent to bluffing. However, it does kind of matter, because if he never bluffs, then B will have an open goal to just fold the six, and if he always bluffs, then B, we already went through this, if he always bluffs, then B can call the, the, the 3 and the 4 and the 5. So, whilst A is indifferent to bluffing, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter what he does. Um, and yeah, since, since it's a zero-sum game, if A never bluffs, B will get more walks, have an easier time, win more money that way. And when B wins money, then A has to lose money, because it's a zero-sum game. So, we need some bluffs. So we have B strategy. Um, what is A strategy with the one to the five? 
A then needs to make B indifferent to calling with his bluff catches. Um, when player A shoves, player B gets 3 to 1 odds, so they will, he will still only need to win 25% at a time. Obviously with the 8, he wins more than 25%, it's the nuts, he wins 100%. With the 7, again, he wins more than 25% because uh, as our strategy with A has includes the 6 and the 8, so um, B's bluff catcher is the 6. So to stop B calling with a 6, A now needs to balance his range so that his better and worse hands are in a 3 to 1 ratio. So A's better hands than the bluff catcher are the 7 and the 8. So a GTO strategy would shove a worse hand one third as often as those to keep the same ratio of 3 to 1. So A could shove, you know, having to shove uh, one third of two cards is the same as um, having, um, when, when you have five cards, you would shove <laughs> a fifth of two thirds of the time with each of them, or you could just pick the five and shove two, that two thirds of the time, which is obviously the the easiest strategy um, and is better in two ways. Um, if you pick the five and it turns out that B's a maniac calling station and he calls it off with the three or the four, then you win with the five and you don't you wouldn't win with the one. So it gives you a little bit of margin for error there. And uh, also going back to what I said earlier about the uh, rock, paper, scissors, where um, we can be balanced but exploitable if we're being predictable. So depending on our method of randomness, um, if it's too predictable, say we always call when, I don't know, um, it's a rainy day or something, I don't know. Any, anything that's predictable, say, um, you could, someone could figure that out. If unpredictable is true randomness, and you have a random number generator when you're at the poker table, um, because your hand is, you know, presumably randomly generated. So it's easier to use your hand um, to randomize your decisions. So by using, um, instead of using, deciding on an ad hoc basis between the one, two, the three, the four, and the five, if you just choose one of them, that's already, that's that's a fifth of the time, and it's gonna be completely random one fifth of the time, um, provided that the shuffle is random, and it's gonna be completely unreadable. So, you know, to use, to pick the five and shove two thirds of the time, you would still need a, some kind of random number generator to figure out when to shove and when to not, two thirds. But um, it will make you a lot less predictable than if you're trying to shove a fifth of two thirds of the time with each of the, the, one, the cards one to five. All right, final slide. So we have reached our GTO strategies for this game. Um, player A strategy, it has uh, six, seven, eight, and a random two thirds of the time with the five. So with that, you make a uh, player B indifferent to calling of his bluff catcher, because you have the better hand three, qu uh, three quarters of the time. Um, so you have eight for value, or six, seven, and eight for value. Although the six and the seven really kind of semi bluffs. And player B strategy um, to call with the seven, the eight and around one third of the time to bluff catch with the six. Um, and you can you can even sort of uh, work out the, the equity or the value of each strategy and uh, it will add up to zero and then you could try adjusting either strategy and see if you can get more value as A or B. And each, um, so each, so I think I imagine uh, player A strategy would be quite profitable because he gets the option, he doesn't post a blind player B strategy would be quite negative, you know, unprofitable, but provided they, you know, the blinds move around, they switch each time, it will be zero, and the, the two will cancel each other out, it's a zero-sum game. And, yes, you could adjust B, B strategy to call more often, and you'll see that his, uh, he will lose more often, or adjust him to call less often, and you'll see that um, his, his equity will go down then as well. Um, Maybe not immediately, but definitely if you adjust B strategy and then adjust A strategy to exploit it, 
um, you'll see that any adjustment from these two strategies will lead to a, a loss in equity. Um, all right, in part two, uh, I'll be applying GTO to a real poker game. Um, the main difference is uh, equity. Um, in this sort of simplified game, when B called, that was it, the hand was over, there's a showdown, and who had the highest card won. But what happens in real poker is that quite often when there's an all-in, uh, that's not the end of the hand, there's some more cards dealt out. And if the one could beat the eight, then player A has a lot more semi-bluffs and profitable bluffs, and it, and player B will have to call a lot, or can call a lot more often. If he only needs, if he only needs to win 25% of the time and the, the, the one has 20% equity, or uh, say, say the two had 20% equity, then even though it's almost never ahead, um, it might still be a call against someone shoving too often, so that sort of thing. Um, but I will apply it to an actual poker game rather than carrying on with the, um, the abstract situation here. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, um, hopefully that'll be out pretty soon. I'll be working on it this week. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, I'll be on the hand in the comments. Uh, I might share some links to good good articles that I've, I've read online um, and um, some of those calculators and stuff. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and so let me know. Uh, this has been James Keys from PokerVIP.com. Hope you enjoy the video.